Hey, everyone. So as my work on this presentation progressed, it, be it, it became increasingly clear that I had a stronger message that I would like to convey. And this is why I'm changing the title of my talk to Interdisciplinary Computing, Theory and Practice. <laughs> so my name is Igor. You can find me on the internet. I'm a big fan of Pokemon and a strong supporter of the Pokemon rights movement. Got to free them all. <laughs> and I also suffer from chronic depression. Um, and I tell you this because mental health affects us all and the stigma just silences us. So let's talk about it and break down the stigma because we're people first and we need to take care of ourselves and of each other. And as part of the human experience, we humans often try and divide the world into these neat little boxes where everything makes sense and everything is separated, when in reality, things are a lot more connected than they may seem or than we're willing to admit. And um, computing science is one of the places where, where we can see this pretty well. So to give you a few examples, knitting a sweater is a way of proving a theorem. In order to define parsers and grammars, we use the theoretical frameworks from linguistics. In order to analyze financial markets, we use the same statistical models that bots use to generate random tweets. Information theory is rooted in statistical probabilities. Um, designing fair algorithms that don't reproduce the cultural biases and power structures of society is a form of applied feminism. When we try and reduce the complexity of our code, this is really a form of applied psychology. Um, computational processes can be modeled in terms of formal logic. And this fo these formal logical systems can then be implemented as electronic circuits. And these circuits depend on physical phenomena, phenomena such as transistors. Um, and the physical reality that we can um, experience is limited by the amount of information that we can perceive. But at the end of the day, computers are still real and messy and cosmic rays will blast down from outer space and destroy your computer. And so you can see that all of these things are connected and I want to really promote this idea of interdisciplinary thinking by drawing some of the strong connections between seemingly unrelated concepts that we encounter in computing science and that have also popped up over the course of computing history. And so it begins. So what does weaving have to do with programming? It all starts in the early 1800s where there was this thing called the Jacquard loom. And this was a mechanical weaving device that would be programmed using punched cards. Um, and this weaving device was one of the main inspirations for Charles Babbage's theoretical device called the analytical engine, which then Lady Ada, Countess of Lovelace, uh, went ahead and wrote what is considered to be the first computer program in 1843. And this was also to be controlled by punched cards. And then in 1890, a company called the Tabulating Machine Company, which is now IBM, produced the first ever big data technology, a tabulating machine. And it also used punched cards. And then we have the ENIAC, which was the first stored program computer in the 1940s. And it also accepted IBM punched cards for input and output. Um, also, this is what a programmer looks like. So we have these IBM punch cards, and they remained a common storage, program storage medium until the late uh, 1980s. So like over this course of like 200 years, they, they kept uh, popping up and remaining in use. And what used to be good for weaving fabrics was now controlling general purpose computers. So what does maths have to do with formal logic? A long time ago, the Greek philosopher Aristotle 
came up with sentences that formed logical conclusions while reminding humans that they will die. The syllogisms, as these sentences were called, had the shape of every human is mortal, Socrates is a human, uh, therefore Socrates is mortal. Basic logical conclusion. And this is an early logical system that went on to inf influence a lot of logicians over the years. Um, but also let's not forget that um, Aristotle was quite the misogynist, so perhaps we should, we, well, perhaps not everything that they said was completely logical, so to speak. Um, and then, so coming out of this early logic, um, we fast forward to the early uh, 1900s, and in Germany, in Göttingen, mathematicians were freaking out because they were trying to make sense of mathematics and they started finding all of these contradictions and paradoxes um, such as Russell's paradox. And like math mathematics didn't seem to be working all of the time. And so um, around this time, uh, Emmy Nether was working at the University of Göttingen on theoretical physics and then later group theory and topology, which um, have gone on to serve as the foundation of type theory. Um, but what all of these other mathematicians and logicians were doing in Göttingen, as, as, in Göttingen assembled around this person called David Hilbert, um, is they were trying to build a solid foundation for mathematics. And they wanted to build this foundation on top of logic. Um, and specifically, they wanted some sort of logical system where any true statement could be derived from first principles by following a few simple axioms. So you've got these rules, you just follow them, and you can derive all of the rules for all of mathematics from those few um, simple basic axioms. Um, and this, this work, resulted in the creation of a lot of new formal logics, and it marked a very important crossover between mathematics and philosophy. Um, and what it really showed us was that mathematics could be expressed in terms of logic, and that these two fields were very strongly related or linked or connected. Okay, now, we've got these logical systems. What do they have to do with electronics? Again, we need to start a bit earlier in history. So in the 1600s, um, there was this person who, apart from discovering calculus and having really amazing hair, um, was an early adopter of binary numbers. His name is Georg Leibniz. And um, so he was one of he, he was one of the early persons to experiment with these binary number systems. And then 200 years later, we've got um, these three gentlemen. And so one of them um, is Boole, whose name has found itself into most programming languages with the Boolean types. And he came up with this thing called algebra, which is an algebra for truth. And then De Morgan came up with something slightly related called De Morgan's Laws, which are laws for transformations between truth statements. So these were logicians, and they were doing highly theoretical work. But then, in 1937, um, this person called George Stibitz, was, uh, who was working at Bell Labs at the time, uh, assembled this thing. And this is one of the first, uh, the first adding machines. This is a, a one-bit binary adder, and he called it the Model K, where the K stands for kitchen table, because that's where he assembled this machine. Um, and so, yeah, so we've got, we've got Leibniz, we've got Boole and De Morgan supplying these laws, we've got the, these ideas coming together to form this one very simple machine, this one-bit binary adder. And um, this, so 
this, this was work being done at Bell Labs. And so if we look at other things that happened at Bell Labs over the years, this is actually quite interesting because Bell Labs played a very important role. So we've got transistors being discovered at Bell Labs, error correcting codes, information theory being developed at Bell Labs, the cosmic radio wave background, one of the greatest breakthroughs in physics, also being discovered at Bell Labs. Then we've got the Unix operating system. And finally, the C programming language that plagues us to this day that was also um, developed at Bell Labs. So this, this has been a very important um, place for computing science and physics history. But we're getting ahead of ourselves. So to the actual point, um, with these three basic ideas, uh, we went from theory to practice. We went from logic to electronics. And this is ultimately what led to modern computing, these basic ideas. Why was Quine so self-obsessed? So the philosopher Quine was known for studying indirect self-knowledge in language, as in spoken and written language. And uh, the paradox is that these kinds of uh, indirect self-references can produce. And so when we go back to Hilbert's program of building this new foundation of mathematics based on logic, there was one person who was ready to drop the mic, and that was Kurt Gödel. So this is Gödel, and Gödel always has a really creepy look on his face. Like if you look at photos of Kurt Gödel, it's just so creepy. Um, and so Kurt Gödel took this idea of indirect self-reference from Quine, um, but he applied it to logic. So he was able to construct this uh, sentence in logic that was unprovable, but was still true. And so this proved that logic was incomplete, and the result became known as uh, Gödel's incompleteness theorem, which is a pretty well-known result. Um, and so what this means is that there are unprovable truths. There are things that you can express in logic that are true, but you cannot prove that they are true, but they're still true. So that's pretty bad. And for David Hilbert, who wanted to have like a very solid, good foundation, this was like, this was his worst nightmare, right? Because this basically means that you cannot have you cannot prove every, yeah, you cannot prove everything. You cannot prove everything about logic, and therefore you cannot prove everything about mathematics, because mathematics is expressed in terms of logic. Um, and then Douglas Hofstetter uh, later went on to co to coin the term Quine to refer to programs that produce a copy of their own source code. Um, so this is a concept that originated in language, then went to logic, and then came to programs. And um, this right here, this is an example of a Quine written in Ruby from Tom Stewart's book, Understanding Computation. And so if you run this program, you will get exactly this output again. Um, that's what a Quine is, which I think is pretty cool and pretty fascinating. and. Pretty mind-bending. So with Gödel's epic mic drop, uh, there was really little hope left for, for like a solid basis of mathematics and solid basis for knowledge um, because that's really what logic is about. It's about expressing knowledge, discovering knowledge, um, and sort of the, the process of thinking. And so one question that still remained open though was the question of the Entscheidungsproblem, also known as the de decision problem. And this problem asked for an algorithm that can determine if a logical statement is provable. So given a statement, can you write a function that will tell you if this statement is provable or not? And um, the final nail in the coffin was when two mathematicians independently published papers at the same time, both proving that the Entscheidungsproblem uh, is undecidable. And this was game over. Like, this is game over for logic. 
There is no, there's things we cannot know, there's things we cannot prove, this is pretty bad. Um, but what is more, even more interesting than this result that they came up with is how the results were proven. So the first paper was written by Alonzo Church, um, who discovered the system called the Lambda Calculus. And uh, this system is a definition of what is effectively calculable. Uh, and it's based on functions. So this is the world's first functional programming language. And it defines what is computable. And this is the same model of computation that still, to this day, serves as the very fundament of every functional programming language. So like, take any functional programming language, be it Lisp or Haskell or you name it. It's going to have this computational model at its heart. Now, the other mathematician who also published a paper was Alan Turing, which maybe is a little bit m more well known than, uh, than Alonzo Church. Um, and he also came up with a model of computation. So they both came up with models of computation to answer this completely different question about uh, the Entscheidungs problem. And so the model of computation that Turing came up with was completely different to the one that Church had. Um, so this model is called the Turing machine. And a Turing machine is, in a sense, the simplest kind of computer that you can imagine. It's just this infinite tape, and you have a set of rules, and you have this possibility of reading and writing one field on this infinite tape at a time and you can sort of move along the tape, um, but you can only follow the rules that you have pre-programmed. Um, and this is also um, a description of what is computable. So you can, you can, any computable function can be implemented in terms of the lambda calculus or in terms of a Turing machine. And also the Turing machine model is still used to this day to study what is computable. OK, so when we pull all of these threads together, when we pull all of these ideas together, all of these different fields, what we get is computation. So everything is connected. OK, so computing history is nice and all, but how does this affect our everyday programming? How does this affect our life as programmers? Um, and what does this have to do with mini Canran and logic programming? Because this is one of the things that I wanted to talk about. So logic programming is a programming paradigm that is based on formal logic, and it's a way of thinking about computation and computer programs in terms of logical relations. Um, and one of the consequences of this design is that programs can run backwards. So in a logic, uh, in a logic programming language, the input and the output are just variables. And um, there isn't really a distinction between them anymore. So you can ask for all of the inputs that could produce a certain output, which um, is quite interesting. Um, and what does this have to do with interdisciplinary thinking? Well, it turns out that logic programming allows us to explore and demonstrate a lot of these connections firsthand. So what is Mini Canran? Mini Canran is a DLL a domain-specific language for logic programming in Scheme. Uh, Scheme being a language in the Lisp family of languages, so it has a lot of parentheses. Don't be scared, it'll be fine. Um, and the point is, it allows you to do logic programming. So Minicanron is very small. This is the entire code of a system called MicroCanron, which is a stripped-down version of the core of Minicanron. This is, this is literally it. This is all there is to it. Um, and it's also very simple. It's, bu it's built out of um, just three basic operators. We have conjunction, which is a logical and, disjunction, which is a logical or, unification, which more or less means two values are equal, and we also have a way of defining variables and then making statements about those variables. This is all there is to it. Um, so here's an example of running a program in Minicanron. 
And so we've got Q, which is a logic variable. And this is sort of the, the, the query variable. This is where we bind our output to. So whatever we unify with Q will be returned back to us. Um, so in this case, we unify Q with the symbol hello. And it returns us back a list of answers. Um, but it only contains one answer, and the answer is hello. Yeah? Make sense so far? I hope so. Uh, no, there's no quote missing. That's a lisp thing. It's intended. Um, and so because we get a list back, or we get a list back because we could get more than one answer, and this is also why we need to specify how many answers we want to get back maximum. So that's what the one says. It just says, give me max one answer. So just to cover a few, um, few other examples, so in case of a contradiction, the result will be empty. So true is not equals to false under any circumstance, so we just get back the empty list. Um, and in this case, so this is also the case when you try to bind a logic variable to two different values. So we try and unify Q with donut, and then we try and unify Q with bagel. And it cannot be donut and bagel at the same time. So there is sort of an and conjunction between those two terms. Uh, so we also get the empty list back. So what if we wanted to introduce an or? So there's this expression called condi, which is sort of modeled around, syntactically modeled around schemes cond, which is like a multi-if statement, or sort of like a switch true with different cases. And so we've got. Um, so each, each one of these condi lines is sort of like an independent line that will be tried independently. So we've got, we first try Q equals donut, that goes through, then we sort of backtrack and try the other branch and say, okay, Q equals bagel. So it's, it's a logical or and donut. Uh, Q can be either a donut or a bagel because donuts are not bagels, they're different. Um, so our, our programming is actually in, in, well, our logic programming is actually a form of theorem proving um, because the way that this works is we search this solution space for answers. So we've got some constraints. Uh, the constraints are that these things need to be equal in, in these ways. And we search this space and we try and find a solution. And when we find a solution, we've proven a theorem. We've proven that you can find that particular constellation. Um, and the, the path of inferences that we took to get to that conclusion is a proof. Sort of, you can think of it like the stack trace. Like the stack trace tells you how you got there, that is your proof. Um, so, when we have this donut and bagel program, we can translate this into a logical statement. So we can translate it directly into formal logic and say there exists a variable Q for which donut of Q is true or bagel of Q is true. And then we can apply rules from formal logic. So here we're just applying the uh, or elimination rule, which allows you to eliminate from an or statement allows you to eliminate either the left side or the right side. So here we pick the left side and say, we conclude donut. And here we say, we conclude bagel. And so we get the same results, informal logic. So this is sort of the equivalent, right? Um, now, one of the fun and frustrating aspects of Mini Canron is that our search for a proof might actually never end. So uh, this, uh, and this is a demonstration of the undecidability of the halting problem. Like this is really what it's about. Um, this is what Turing was telling us, um, that you might get into a situation where you keep searching for answers and you just can't find them. And um, so here's an example of a, a Mini Canron program that never stops. And if we take a look at the proof tree that Mini Canron generates, or yeah, that the execution of the program generates, then we can see why this happens. So we've got this run, and we wanna call this Nevero relation. Um, and 
so we've got Nevero. So what is Nevero? Well, we've got two branches. The first branch is true is equals to false. So we try that. That fails because it's not. So we go to the next one, which is Nevero. So what is Nevero? Well, we've got true equals to false, which doesn't work. So you know we keep going. And there isn't really a way, there is, or at least there isn't always a way to detect these kind of situations. Um, and so this, this example of the halting problem, which is really equ equivalent to the Entscheidungsproblem, um, this which states that it's not possible to generally decide if a, pro uh, if a program will stop or not. So the halting problem isn't just limited to logic programming. It isn't just limited to this example that I just showed you. The true significance of the Entscheidungsproblem is that it applies to any Turing-complete programming language, which is to say pretty much any pro programming language. So whatever language you are using in your day-to-day -day work, you will be affected by this. Um, and I mean, if you've ever run into an infinite loop, you've probably had a pretty hard time debugging it. And this is exactly the reason why, because we cannot predict. There is no automated way to predict whether we will run into an infinite loop or not. Um, and this can be generalized to bugs in general. Like for many classes of bugs, we just cannot know if they will occur or, occur or not. And this is really what makes our everyday programming um, pretty challenging, I would say. OK, so remember how circuits and binary adders are made out of logic? Um, what we are going to do now is we're going to build our own binary adder inside of Mini Canron. So we've got these circuits, and they have these switches that can, be, that can either open or close the circuit. And we can use these switches to implement logical operators. So this is an AND gate. If both switches are closed, then the whole circuit is closed. This is an OR gate. If either one of them are closed, then the circuit is closed. Makes sense, I hope. Um, and so in an abstract sense, we can also talk about these gates using these logic gate symbols. And so we've got an XNOR and an AND gate. Um, and we can use these to build what is called a half adder. So this is the schematic diagram for a half adder. Uh, and it takes two bits A and B and produces a sum bit and a carry bit. And so we can take two of these half adders and we can combine them and get a full adder. So now we've got an adder that adds two binary digits and produces two output or three, three output digits two output digits and one carry digit, um, where digit is a bit because it's a binary digit. And that's where the word bit comes from. Um, and so we've got this uh, full adder. And so we can compose a bunch of one bit full adders to build an n bit adder. Um, so And you can use this to add two n bit numbers together. And that's pretty much how hardware works. I mean, this is what is inside of your computer and your phone. Um, and so because these logical relations are quite straightforward, we can define logic gates as logical relations. Uh, so here we've got XOR gate and an AND gate in Mini Canron, and it's pretty straightforward. And if you've ever seen a, a truth table, this is literally just a truth table. This is mapping the combinations of bits to whatever the output is. Um, so then we can combine these logic gates to build a half adder. So we've got XOR and an AND gate. And we can compose two full adders, uh, two half adders to build a full adder. And this is exactly the same thing that you saw in the schematic earlier. I mean, you can pretty much read it one to one, right? You can just compare the two and see that they're exactly the same. Um, and so, so we've got this adder. Um, we can define an addition operation. So we pronounce this as plus O. And this takes two input out, uh, arguments and one output. Um, and the carry, the carry in is just zero. So that's why we have that extra zero there. 
And if we want to then define minus, if we want to define the minus operation, because this is a completely relational system, minus is just plus with the input and the output arguments flipped. And it just works, which is pretty amazing. Um, and so once we have this implementation, what we can do is we can ask Minikaren, generate me some answers. For example, which integers add up to the number five? Like, give me all of, give me all of the integers that add up to five. And sure enough, Mini Canron will just list out all of the possibilities because it's Mini Canron and it's almost like magic. And your CPU and, and ALU may seem like magic, and they probably are, but in principle, this is all that they're doing. Like, this is what your computer is doing. Uh, just combining some logic gates. Our computers are made out of logic. Sorry. It gets better, though, um, because there's a relation between logic programming and parsing. Uh, so Philip Wadler, as uh, Steffi already mentioned, wrote this paper titled How to Replace Failure by a List of Successes. Um, I followed this advice. Sadly, my list of successes is still empty. And this paper concerns itself with this thing called parser combinators, uh, which you may have heard about in the previous talk, if you were there, or maybe with in one of the other talks this morning. Um, and for some reason, this paper that concerns itself with these combinators was cited by the authors of Mini Canron. What does it mean? What did the authors of Mini Canron see? What the hell does logic programming have to do with parsing? Like, these are two completely different things. What the hell? So it turns out that uh, the two problems are, in fact, very similar when it comes to implementation uh, because they both have to do with a tree search. So what is a grammar? A grammar is a description of a tree that sort of keeps expanding or that can keep expanding recursively. So, for example, this is the grammar of the lambda calculus. And we can use this grammar to enumerate all of the possible expressions in that language. And you can, you can do this for any context-free grammar. So you could do this for like, the, the grammar of JavaScript and enumerate all the valid JavaScript expressions, right? Um, OK. So what about logic programming, though? Well, a logic program is a description of a tree that keeps expanding. Sound familiar? And this is the grammar of the lambda calculus written in Mini Canron. So you can pretty much directly implement grammars in a logic programming language. And it's sort of, if I go back here, this and this, like if you tilt your head a little bit, it looks pretty similar. And what we can do is ask Mini Canron to enumerate all possible expressions of the language, and Mini Canron will just do it. So you, you kind of have this very strong link between these two fields, which you might not necessarily see like on first sight, but it's still there, and it's very deep. Um, so a parser searches a tree for matches, and a theorem prover searches a tree for valid answers. It's kind of the same thing. And these problems are almost the same. And pretty much the same techniques can be applied to both of them. Philip Wadler drops the mic. Quines. So Mini Canron is Turing complete. And this means that you can do anything with Mini Canron that you could do with any other Turing complete uh, programming language. This is one of the results of the, this is basically one of the things that Turing completeness means. It means that you can translate between different Turing complete systems. Um, and it also means that we can implement an interpreter for any other Turing complete language in Mini Canron. So what is an interpreter? Um, an interpreter is a program that takes the source code of another program and evaluates or executes it, um, and then maybe produces a result. Uh, and 
So one of the things that uh, you will find in the Lisp 1.5 manual is this beautiful piece of code, which is uh, a metacircular interpreter. So that is to say, a Lisp interpreter written in Lisp itself. Just take a moment, take that in. Um, and so we can take this metacircular interpreter and we can port it into Mini Canran. And because Lisp is such a concise language and because Lisp has this idea of lists as code or because the code and the data structures are the same structure, it's very easy to define a metacircular interpreter in Lisp in general and porting it to Mini Canran doesn't add that much code. So this is literally all the code that you need to build an interpreter for Lisp in Mini Canran. But because it's a Mini Canran, we now have a relational interpreter. And what that means is, well, first of all, we can run it forward. So we can run it like we would run any interpreter. We feed it a program. It will evaluate the expression as it would if, uh, as, as if we evaluated it in Scheme or in Lisp, in another Lisp directly. So in this case, we have this thing called the identity function. That's the lambda xx. So that's just a function that returns its argument. And we apply that to the symbol me. And what we expect to get back is just a symbol me, because like x of x of me is me. Um, and so when we run this through the metacircular interpreter, sure enough, we get a list of one answer, me. Um, but because this is a relation, we can also go the other way around. So we could say, give me all of the programs that return the symbol me. And sure enough, me Cameron will go ahead and generate some programs. So the first one is just the symbol me directly. So it's like, oh, yeah, I guess that's a valid program. The second one is a function that returns the symbol me applied to anything, which is also valid. It's like, yeah, call it, call it with whatever, and it's always going to return me in either case. And the third one is actually the example that I gave you previously. It's the identity function applied to the symbol me. So Mini Canran, just by generating examples, came up with exactly the same example that I provided, um, which is pretty cool. And we can, did I, what did I put in here? Oh yes, so this is the punchline, damn it. <laughs> so what we can also do is we can ask for a program Q that returns the value Q. So we can ask for a program that computes its own source code, which is also known as a quine. And sure enough, we give this to Mini Canran. Mini Canran will give us a quine back. Um, and we can also just let Mini Canran enumerate quines by using run star instead of run one, and it will just keep running forever and give you all of the quines of the world. Um, and we can get even, even more crazy than this. Uh, we can generate twines. So we, we generate two programs, P and Q, such that P evaluates to the source code of Q, and Q evaluates to the source code of P. And you can just keep playing this game over and over again. Um, which is pretty amazing. I mean, this is amazing. So thank you, Will Bird, for that. Um, this is one of the main authors of Mini Canran. OK, so what is the conclusion? In conclusion, Mini Canran is a really cute little tiny uh, logic programming language that provides a very nice way to explore different aspects of computer science interactively. And it's just a really nice playground. And also, we need interdisciplinary thinking to find these deeper connections and ultimately make progress. Because at the end of the day, disciplines are an illusion. Computers are real. Everything is messy. And everything is connected. Thank you. Now, before I take questions, um, I'm a big believer in pretending to read the literature and then bragging about it. So I will provide a list of references for further reading. Um, and there's five publications that I want to highlight. Um, 
The first one, the reason schema, this one explains how many Canron works. The second one, Quine generation, talks about this whole Quine's aspect and how you can write these interpreters in mini Canron. The micro Canron paper explains how to build your own mini Canron and it's very easily ported to other languages. So you can port it to your language of choice and I think it's a very fun project and it's only a couple lines of code. Then there is this Philip Wadler paper that was also already mentioned previously that I highly recommend you read because it's sort of, it's this crossover between parsing theory and logic programming that I find really interesting. And it just does this via tree search. And then finally, in the spirit of interdisciplinary programming and interdisciplinary thinking, uh, Unspeakable Things by Laurie Penny is probably the best book that I read this year. And it's about justice and you should probably read it. So with that, any questions? No? All right, yeah, one, one in the front. Hi, Igor, um, thanks for the talk. Um, I have a question. Is it possible to give the quine to mini can run and then get the result back that it is a quine? So go backwards? Because it generates all the quines. Mm -hmm. But you can run it in reverse, meaning you can- Yeah, I think it should be possible. I mean, we can try it after the talk, but I don't see why not. Mm. Yeah, that should work. And, and could that then be used in some form of code analysis? I don't know, I mean, there probably is a lot of interesting, um, there's probably a lot of interesting things that you can do there with like meta programming in general, right? Um, but it's it's definitely a field that still has a lot of potential to be explored, and I encourage you to do so. <laughs> I don't have a question per se, I just want to give a tip if people are interested in uh, all this, then there's uh, also a really nice course, it's called From Nantes to Tetris. Yes. I don't know if you mentioned it. Uh, and it goes from the NAND gate, where which is a basic block where you can build all the other gates, and you go step by step from the one, uh, one bit adder to the full adder, etc., until you uh, program Tetris and you've built all the, the stuff in between. So the gates, the compiler, the assembler, yeah. and the programming language. Yeah, it's it's really nice. I, I've looked at that and it seems pretty cool. Uh, another one that I can recommend for that is uh, Charles Petzold's Code. That's the name of the book, it's just called Code, whatever. Um, but it sort of does the same journey, like build a, build a machine from the ground up, like from the physical to the gates to, electronics and so on and so forth. Yeah, understanding computation is also really nice for the, um, for like all the theoretical stuff. Yeah, I'll publish the slides and there will be references so you can go look at them. All right, any, any other? There was one, okay. Yeah, so um, how how fast is, is this thing? So how, how fast does this go generating quines? Uh, uh, yeah, so I the, just qu wonder. the quines are actually pretty fast. That's like a uh, couple milliseconds to generate those. Um, but of course, performance is a general hard problem in logic programming because it is building this huge tree in many cases. So there's, I mean, for one, there's still a lot of research to be done on how that can be optimized. And I think this can possibly also benefit a lot from, um, from these sort of cross-discipline, uh, interdisciplinary work, because there's been a lot of optimization work in other fields. Um, but the other thing is, it also sort of depends on how you write your program, right? So 
you can you can do your own optimizations to make sure that the tree search that the tree doesn't expand infinitely and sort of cut off that search early on and there's a few tricks that you can use and basically any prolog book that you can find is going to give you a lot of tips for how that works okay thank you All right, thank you very much.